little extra giddy up on it at 95. And that's about as much emotion as you will see from you, Darvish. Talk about the great live stuff. Mike Trout throws in and Simmons looking. Daniel Venosa, Escobar chasing a slider out of the zone. Hugh Darvish so far has it working. Right through the heart of the Diamondbacks order. Two Dodger starts. Two 10 strikeout performances. He's got his first one, two, three inning. And he chases for strike three. Darvish ultimately wins the battle for his fifth K of the night. Curveball strikes out Walker. Swung on and missed. Swing and a miss. Swung on and missed. Strike three. Welcome to 1225 Live. Happy Monday. And baseball is back. We are so happy because pitchers and catchers are starting to report all week long. We'll have the latest from Florida and Arizona, so make sure you stay with us. But before all of that, we still have free agents who are on the move. The friendly confines just got a lot friendlier with the addition of you Darvish to the Cubs. Where does that Cubs rotation rank right now in the National League? We will share that with you. Plus, what does this mean for Jake Arrieta and other free agents who are still on the market? Allison Footer will stop by with the latest. So all that and so much more today on the show. But we start Monday the way we start every day here on 1225 Live with Danny Wexelman, our social savant. Hey, Danny, happy Monday. Happy Monday. How's so it going? exciting. I know. Everything is just happening. Baseball is back. I can feel that spring training energy. I love it. Yes, I'm with you, dude. So listen, Anthony Kasherman, our friend, is also in, in the mood. And he's kind of stirring the pot a little bit. And he wrote an article asking 30 questions, 30 burning questions for each team. And you and I are going to try to answer two of them. And we picked our most scintillating ones to talk about. So I'm going to go with the Angels. Yeah. He wants to know, is Major League Baseball ready for Shohei Otani? And is Shohei Otani ready for Major League Baseball? Well, listen, we haven't seen a guy like this in 100 years. Right. The game is evolving. It's changing. Yeah. And a guy like him is not only going to change the way that rotations are built, but the way that managers are thinking and playing their chess match. And I definitely think that the game is ready for a guy like him. Is he ready for the game? He better be. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about the Angels, and I'll predict where they fall uh, in that division this season. But my burning question, the one that stood out to me in this article, was the fact that I uh, I want to know if Rick Porcello and David Price are going to thrive again in Boston, right? These yeah. two uh, made up what was supposed to be a super dominant rotation going into last year, but unfortunately they didn't live up to the hype. So will they be able to do that in 2018? And will the Red Sox potentially be able to not only uh, win the division again or yeah. maybe nab one of those wild card spots, uh, or do do what you think and not even make the playoffs, <laughs> which I think uh, is an interesting uh, prediction. So we'll see. Hot. Burning. Burning hot. We're going with the theme. All right, speaking of predictions, this is the time to make all of those predictions, right? right? Uh, we are going to predict how we believe the AL West is going to shake out. And for a reminder, just in case you need one, not that you do, but uh, let's go ahead and remind you those Astros won the division by a cool 21 games en route to their playoff domination and eventual World Series victory. The other four teams in the division were within five games of each other at season's end. And uh, more than one team in the division obviously improved this offseason. So let's discuss 2018, Danny. What is your prediction for how this division shakes out? Okay, you and I are on the same page with this. Yeah. And the Astros are going to win this division again. Yeah. Easily. No, no contest about this at all. They're the best team in baseball. And in the offseason, they were a little quiet to start. They all had that World Series hangover. And then they go out and get Garrett Cole to beef up their rotation. They got Joe Smith to help out in the bullpen. If they have a healthy Carlos Correa for the entire season, can you even imagine? Justin Verlander will be there for a full season. This team spells trouble for the rest of the division, the rest of the league, and I just think they're kind of they're going to come out on top. Yeah, they do have to make sure that bullpen is all scored away from start to finish, but I do agree with you. I do think they're going to run away with this division and be huge uh, postseason contenders again this year, but I don't think they're going to be the only team repping the AL West this postseason. Okay. I do believe that the Angels end up making it to the postseason because this is a team that was teetering on a great. They were good last year, but they went ahead in the offseason and with the additions of Shohei Otani, like you mentioned, Ian Kinsler, Zach Kosart, uh, Justin Upton, all in the last year plus, they have starting position players who all are dominant in this lineup. They have all either made an all-star team or won a gold glove or both. So these guys know how to play. Plus, you got this rotation 
The has to stay healthy, but if they do, they really could make some stuff happen. And they have the best player in baseball. Why is that even the last thing I'm mentioning? Just because everyone knows. It's a cherry on top. Yeah, Mike Trout is synonymous with greatness and uh, him being there, helping a lot of these young guys improve and gelling this team together. I think this team has a real great shot, not only at the wild card, but making a little bit of a run in the postseason. Yeah, no, I totally agree. The Otani factor, he hasn't even played a game and we're already saying that the Angels are going to be are better. I liked how you said they were teetering on greatness and, and they're definitely going to go over the edge. The Cozart acquisition, I know I love that one <laughs> for the many reasons, the donkey reason too. And it's exciting. The team's exciting and I think they're finally there. Billy Epler's like, all right, see, all the hard work, it's paying off. Everyone was patient. Now, Mike Trout, let's get you let's get you a ring, man. Yeah, I'm just desperate to see him in the postseason. Yeah. Come on, it's just it's it's been so long. All right, so we're talking about spring training, and we're going to have coverage yes. throughout the week uh, as pitchers and catchers are starting to report today. It's the Mets and the Pirates pitchers and catchers you will see in their respective camps. So we wanted to throw it back to a photo that we remember for a couple years ago. <laughs> this is John Neese, who played in both of those organizations. Here he is at Port St. Lucie. Just reminding everyone, this is how you put on sunscreen. Right? Is this how you put on sunscreen, Lex? Um, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. I hate getting sunscreen <laughs> in my eyes. It's the worst thing possible, that burn. Yeah. When you're on the beach, plus the sun in your eyes, too. What are you doing, Johnny? He's just setting an example for everybody. He just wants everyone to be safe and wear your sunscreen. Yeah. I love this photo so much. <laughs> I, I love to put sunscreen on, and I love that he's like his face is all squished. Is that how you put your sunscreen on? I, I don't use the spray, because the spray goes everywhere. It's windy. You know when it's windy and you spray, and then it's just a mess. But yeah. I have a photo that could rival this photo. Okay. It's something that have it broke the internet. You see here Giancarlo Stanton with Odell Beckham Jr. City boys uh, hanging out together. So this is our question of the day today. We want to know who are other tandems and other cities that could rival these two guys larger than life. So if you're not on Facebook, head over now. Let us know who are the two guys in another city, in other sports too. Put them together. Let us know who's larger than life. Should we, uh, sh should I say one? Go ahead, an example. yeah, start us off. So I'm thinking uh, Jose Altuve and J.J. Watt. It's a good are one. a great example in Houston. Great one. Not necessarily height for height reasons, but for all the other reasons. Well, of course. They're yeah. just phenomenal. Uh, not only philanthropists, yes. but uh, yeah, they're fantastic at their respective sports. So they're pretty good. We'll, uh, we'll see how, how those uh, responses come in. Yes. Name a more iconic duo. We'll wait. <laughs> That's our question of the day today. Thanks, Danny. You're welcome. Uh, we had someone who could probably help us out with this or maybe even chime in on uh, the iconic duo from Houston as Allison Footer joins us right now. Allison, name an iconic duo. We're kind of mixing sports here in Houston sports that maybe you've seen recently, you've talked to, or you you just believe uh, takes the cake okay well can I just can I change that to trio for like a really good reason yeah so it'd be like a dynamic trio okay so they just had the uh, first ever Houston sports awards here in Houston basically this like glitzy glamorous night where I drew like anybody who's ever been anyone sports wise in Houston for the last 50 years and the highlight was that they honored all of the iconic number 34 so it'd be Nolan Ryan, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Earl Campbell from the Love You Blue Oilers. So all three major sports were represented. It was very cool seeing everybody in the same room um, there to like honor the greatest and the Astros got all kinds of awards. And I mean, really, it was just like a who's who all night. So I have to say that was the dynamic trio of the week. Yeah, we'll let you expand for a trio for those three, absolutely. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, icons there, in uh, not only in uh, Houston, but just in sports in general. So pretty cool to see. All right, let's talk a little baseball, Allison. Uh, Cubs land you, Darvish, six years, $126 million. There were a lot of other teams that were interested. Why is this the best fit for him? Uh, well, right now, while we wait to hear kind of uh, his reasons, and we haven't because, of course, they haven't officially announced it, I would say that it's because they offered him the most um, in the, probably the most years. I think that sixth year has been elusive on both the pitching and the position player side through this whole offseason, which is what everybody's fighting about. Um, and so he got the, the to the number that he, I guess, wanted to hear. Um, it keeps the Cubs under a, under the uh, luxury tax threshold. It um, kind of prevented, I think, some of the other teams from really being able to top that. I think that was a concern with some of the other bigger teams. As we know, the Dodgers have been um, trying to keep things under control a little bit. So um, it sounded like Darvish was, I mean, we'd been hearing for a while, like he's really close to picking a team. I think that he wanted to sign, quite frankly. And... Um, and his representation might be a little bit more reasonable than some of the other representation this offseason. And so he wanted to sign with the team, and he's going to 
be in a pitching staff with uh, a team that's, you know, not that far removed from their World Series championship. So he's a really good chance to win a ring. So I think that he's probably pretty happy with all of this. How much does this signing separate the Cubs in the division from the Brewers and the Cardinals? Yeah, so, I mean, it does, right? I, 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 I am waiting to see what the Brewers do to counter this. But right now, it would say, uh, you'd have to say that the Cubs are going to... Uh, the favorites to win that division. Um, I know that I've been on the Brewers bandwagon and I do feel like if they make a couple more moves or maybe just add a, another starter, do something that they could uh, be keeping pace a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of things that do have to go right with this, uh, with this pitch rotation still, but certainly very strong. I think Darvish is going to thrive in that environment and, uh, and yeah, the Cubs have definitely separated themselves from the, from the Brewers and definitely everybody else. I mean, there are no other teams that really scare me a whole lot, including the Cardinals. All right, let's take this a little bit bigger than just the NL Central. Let's talk about the entire National League. And since the Winter Olympics are currently going on in Pyeongchang, we're going to have you hand out some medals, some bronze, silver, and gold medals in terms of where you rank the Cubs rotation in the National League right now compared to a couple of other really strong rotations as well. So I guess I would give the Cubs the silver medal. Okay. I think that I am sticking with the Nationals for the gold. The Cubs get the silver. The Dodgers get the bronze. Um, oh, interesting. You know, I kind of struggle. Yeah, I struggle with this a little bit because, like, the you know, the Dodgers, um, they have a, so much depth. Uh, when I look at the actual, like, list of projected stars, with Kershaw, Hill, Wood, um, Maeda, Ryu, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you can't deny what these guys have done over uh, the last couple of years. Certainly they could have absolutely won that World Series. Um, but, you know, injuries are always an issue, and, and there have been guys uh, that have spent a lot of time on the DL. They just are so deep in, in what they can replace them with temporarily that they always manage to stay on top. I just still, I look at that Nationals rotation and, you know, I am, as with everybody, I'm completely unimpressed with how they perform as a team in October and they need to do something to uh, change that up a little bit when you have Scherzer, Strasburg, Gio Gonzalez, Tanner Roark, um, you know, still just very solid. And then the Cubs, um, yeah, I mean, it's I you know you could put them like at the one or two also uh, Lester Darvish Hendricks I mean I do like that they have replenished themselves uh, Don Lackey moving on Jake Arrieta being I don't know I'm I'm not that high on him at this point in terms of what he can produce like long term he's just had some issues um, so I do like the the way that the Cubs are are looking right now um, so yeah I'm really not giving you any answers but if I had to you know if I'm just up against it and I absolutely have to rank them I would say the Nationals are still I just still really like that rotation more than everybody else's all right since we're talking about the Cubs edition of you Darvish let's talk about and you talk about how the Cubs are one of the top three teams in the National League let's expand that even further into the majors do you feel like the Cubs are one of the top three rotations in the majors um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, really, because if you go through the American League, I mean, the Astros probably have the best rotation in baseball on paper. Let's play the game on paper because that's all we have right now. Sure. Um, so this is all dependent on health, and it always comes down to that. I mean, guys are going to perform mostly how they've performed in the last couple of years, unless they're hurt, in which case it changes everything. But I would say that the Astros rotation is the best, you know, the Red Sox have um, some fabulous pitchers in their rotation, including Chris Sale, obviously. They've also had some issues because um, they have a very expensive relief pitcher now, David Price, so is that going to change? Um, but, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, I would I put the Cubs um, for sure, like, in the top. I mean, I guess I can't really put them in the top three, right, because I have them second in the – in the in the National League, and so if I have two, this is math, which is not my strong suit. If I have two American League teams in the, in the top three, then that kind of pushes them out. But I would say that the Cubs, um, you know, I, I I would have to say that they'd have, be like three or four. Let's put it that way. All right, so they're in the arms race for sure for uh, uh, best rotation sure. in the majors. All right, so uh, since Darvish signs with the Cubs, that means uh, Jake Arrieta will not return with the Cubs. We uh, presume. Uh, that's the most likely the case there. And he's been linked to several other teams, the Nationals being one of them. You just mentioned that you think the Nationals have the best rotation. What, what would adding Jake Arrieta do? What's the likelihood that this happens? Yeah, I mean, that would be cool. Then they would really have the best rotation, right? I mean, I guess. I don't know how. It's just so hard. And, I mean, that's one of the issues that's, that's really coming up with these fights that are happening between uh, you know, the owners, the agents, and the Players Association is basically the free agency 
is a little backward and in, in which case guys you know enter these the the free agency time in their careers when their best years are behind them and so it's so hard to really determine you know where they're going to be moving forward i mean i really like what you darvish has done in his career i really love what jake arietta has done in his career when he's been on top of his game we just don't know what it's going to be moving forward um and so, yeah, if the Nationals were to get him, I, you know, I like, I think that he would thrive in an environment where he doesn't have to be the guy. He just has to be a guy uh, somewhere in the middle of the rotation. And so I think that, that there is an, um, an opportunity for uh, pitchers of his caliber to be able to just acclimate themselves into a new organization and just do what he has to do and not carry anything more than that. Um, so I think that would be a great place for him. I yeah, we really don't hear anything concrete like they're close or that this is even realistic. Um, you know, you hear a lot of rumors that guys' names get thrown out, and that's some of that is tactics on their agent side to try to scare other teams into signing them. Um, these are things that we see largely in November and December. It's just obviously a very interesting offseason. It's been a little wacky. Um, so it's still impossible to tell, like, where Jake Arrieta is going to end up. Yeah, it's been a lot wacky, and it's uh, getting wackier, I feel like. Uh, the fact that we've got pitchers and catchers reporting this week and still a lot of free agents left on the market. So if Arietta doesn't sign a long-term deal, let's say with the Nationals or a team that is offering him a long-term contract, they have a, a couple of teams out there who have a, a willingness to sign him to maybe a short-term high salary type of deal. How much sense would this make for Arietta and, and where do you think, feel like he will land? Uh, by the way, we have Tim watching us here on Facebook and, and he's asking the same question. Um, yeah, I mean, you hear that and it's a possibility and the way that the business works and the way that, you know, we've seen how things are viewed, then it might not be a bad idea. I think it's an incredibly stupid idea. Let me just go on the record by saying a pitcher who puts himself out there to sign a one or two year deal. You, I mean, those arms are strong, but they're also fragile in a lot of ways. Um, and so you're taking a big risk. So if you want to turn down $120 million over five years because you feel like you've been wronged and you feel like that's just an insult to your baseball integrity, then maybe you should take that chance. But things happen when, you, when your profession is based on the ability of your body parts to carry you to your paycheck. Um, Things can happen, and we've seen that. And so I would I would be more on board with a position player doing something like that. But for you to go into free agency a year older with another 150 innings on your arm, you're taking a chance. I just don't think it's a good idea. You should go for job security. You should sign a four, five, six-year – well, not six because nobody's offering that, but a five-year deal and be happy with it. I like that. Strong take, Allison. Uh, market for several other pitchers now starting to take shape, obviously, with Darvish joining the Cubs. Where do you feel like Lance Lynn and Alex Cobbs and those kinds of guys end up landing? Yeah, I mean, at this point, like if the bigger guys had had signed, then that sets the market and then you can kind of move from there. So, you know, with Darvish off the board, I don't know if that um, gives anybody kind of any indication on what they might be worth. And, it, you know, it's impossible to say like where these guys are end, going to end up. I think that they would be a good addition for the Brewers or, you know, the Phillies. I mean, the Phillies are kind of... Uh, they're kind of knocking, ready to maybe make some noise and, and be a respectable major league team again. Um, and so maybe you sign with these guys thinking like when you're ready to really be ultra competitive in a couple few years, that they'll be right there in the middle of it. Um, twin, you know, the Twins have to, I think the Twins have to do something. I think that the Twins and Brewers really have to do something. Um, and you just can't do what the Brewers did on the offensive side with uh, with Kane and Yelich and and just not improve your pitching. And so I just don't think that they're finished. Um, so maybe those guys can go there, but it's, a, it's you know, I, it's impossible to really gauge like where these guys are going to go, where the best fit is. The best fit is for teams that are desperate for a starting pitcher, and there are a handful of them out there. It's been interesting watching the teams in the NL Central kind of put pressure on each other, right, with Marcelo Zuna signing and then Lorenzo Cain, Christian Yelich, and then you uh, Darvish, and it's just kind of watching these three teams kind of chase each other, even though the Cubs, you know, won the World Series a couple of years ago. They're still in the mix to uh, try and be dominant in this division. So I, I just, I love watching it all happen. And, and we, you know, we kind of have a, a little piece uh, added to that today with um, some relief pitching news. Bud Norris being signed to the Cardinals on a one-year deal. And he had some injury struggles the second half. But the first half, he had a 2-2-3 ERA. He was pitching well with the Angels last year. Uh, what do you think this does to solidify the Cardinals' bullpen? Yeah, I, 
think he could be a good addition when he's healthy. He was very, I remember talking to him last year in Anaheim and he was like so uh, energetic and happy to be in the role that he was in, you know, after the years of, of being a, a starting pitcher with the Astros thing, you know, he moved on, think, you know, he had a couple more decent seasons, but, um, you know, the window is kind of short for pitchers um, like Bud Norris. So to be able to, to move to the bullpen a healthy bud. I mean, he throws very hard. He knows how to get out. He's very competitive. And if you put him in a situation where he can be successful um, and where he's happy and he believes that he can thrive, then I think that he um, he could be a very good addition. So, you know, he used to way back in the day, it has absolutely nothing to do with how he's going to perform now, but he was very dominant over, uh, over the Cardinals. And his nickname actually came from Budweiser beer. Um, and that is uh, actually a true story. So, um, so there's, you know, that connection to St. Louis also. So, you know, maybe that'll revive him a little bit. There you go. That's perfect. Uh, according to John Heyman, by the way, another free agent that we've been talking a lot about, J.D. Martinez and the Red Sox are pretty far off in uh, their final assessment of where they feel like Martinez should play. So the Red Sox feel like they could maybe pivot to Logan Morrison. How would Lomo fit into the Red Sox scheme? Would this even be a possibility? I mean, it's a possibility if you're realistic about what he's going to bring, which is not what J.D. Martinez is going to bring. So if he's your plan B to J.D. Martinez, then be prepared to be disappointed. Um, he had a, Logan Morrison had a really, you know, he had career highs and home runs uh, last year, and um, he's also 30 years old. So, yeah, he had a really good season. And you have to, when it comes to players, in my opinion, like Logan Morrison, you have to continue to keep perspective on what that means in the big picture and and not think that that's what it's going to be moving forward so yeah i mean they need to add some kind of offense and do they want to close the door on jd martinez already i mean it's getting it's really interesting to see things get so ugly between uh, a player who has no contractual obligations to the red sox in any way shape or form and and the red sox i mean they're you know kind of fighting with each other publicly even though they're not making public comments but you hear sources here and there uh that jd's getting kind of frustrated um, and so this is where a team can kind of make a mistake and say, well, you know, you know, despite you, we're going to move on and ha ha ha. Look, we get Logan Morrison. Um, to me, that is not the answer. And if they're really serious about getting a, a, a guy that you can really depend on for those high home run totals as compared to somebody who maybe um, may not produce that consistently again and again, then you have to wait it out for J.D. Martinez. I feel like the Red Sox might be bluffing a little bit to say that they're interested in uh, Logan Morrison, and it's easy to call their bluff because of what the Yankees did in the division. It's like you have to add so many more pieces, I feel like, or at least a huge power bat in order to compete in that division. So uh, that was a, a strange pivot there, but we'll see how this all shakes out. We got one fan question for you, Allison, before we let you go. Jeremy says, will Atlanta make any moves before the season? And uh, they have so many prospects, so they could potentially do something here. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that I would expect the Braves to really, you know, make some kind of big splashy move. I'm not sure that they're ready to do that yet. And I think that they're going to stay the course. I don't know that there's a sense of urgency necessarily like, oh, you know, we have to win like right now. We have to do something big like right now. They need to wait until they're actually going to be able to legitimately think that they can compete in that division and with the talent that they have with the young talent that they have um you know they're tasked with making sure that those guys are put in positions it, it's a cliche but it's so very true which is why i use it a lot the job of the front office the job of the coaching staff is to put young players in positions where they're successful and not where they're going to fail and then the mental part of the game starts taking over. So you have all the talent. When you're loaded with talent and you're 21, 22 years old, whatever it is, it's up to the team to understand you, to know you backwards and forwards, up and down, to know when you're ready to really make that move to be a regular major leaguer. This is not an easy process. So, um, you know, I, I mean, if they wanted to, you know, make – some minor things here and there, uh, tweak things and building toward whatever they're envisioning when they're supposed to be really good. Um, but the Braves are not an organization that's ever going to get ahead of itself and, uh, you know, succumb to, to public pressure or whatever it is uh, to do things prematurely. And so I would just, I would be a little bit more patient while just watching them progress. It's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun process. Yeah, absolutely. And this is going to be a team that's going to be much more uh, involved next year in the free agent market than uh, anything this offseason. Hey, Allison, before we let you go, I am 
two pints down out of these six pints of Grater's ice cream that I started with, <laughs> and I blame you for all of it. I've eaten two pints of that ice cream in like the last three weeks, and uh, it's the best ice cream I've ever had, but it's also kind of ruining my life. <laughs> oh, it is. No, I, seriously, because, you know, when if you don't take it out of the carton into a bowl and limit <laughs> what you are actually going to eat, then you will find that you are at the bottom of that pint very quickly. And the thing with Grater's ice cream is it's packed, it's much more dense than any other ice cream. So whatever you're eating is like double the amount of calories and fat and deliciousness than you're going to find in the same size scoop from another brand. Um, it is. It's addicting. I'm so sorry that I let you know that you can order graders online and they deliver to your door in dry ice, but it is a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. Yes. It's a, a little bit of tragedy as well, but uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm willing to, to deal with it. It's worth it. That's for sure. It's delicious. Uh, so the black Absolutely. raspberry chocolate chip uh, has taken over my life. Allison, thank you so much for joining us and for uh, that extra calorie count to my week. No problem, Alexa. Enjoy it. Thanks. See you soon. All right, we've been talking a little bit about how the Mets and Pirates pitchers and catchers are reporting today. Kind of an unofficial date. I think they have to officially be there tomorrow. Uh, but it's going to be uh, pretty exciting to see this Mets rotation this season, especially if they stay, stay healthy. They had a lot of problems with that last year. We know that Noah Syndergaard only pitched around 30 innings. Jacob deGrom was the only starting pitcher out of that rotation to top 100 innings. And Steven Matz will be watched very closely after he had that elbow surgery back in August. But Steven Matz is down there in Port St. Lucie and he said he is healthy and ready to go. It's really exciting. I had a great off season of workouts and throwing and uh, it's just good to come in here feeling healthy and ready to go. Uh, it's been great. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around this camp and I think it starts with him so I think we're all excited to work under him especially as pitchers with the kind of credentials he has. Yeah it's been really good to have that peace of mind that you know one of my good buddies have had the surgery and I can you know bounce anything off them but at this point I'm feeling 100 percent and kind of past that point, so I'm, you know, ready to get back to it. So, Danny, the interesting thing about this Mets rotation is the fact that uh, it all is reliant upon their health. And right. I feel like Mets Nation is very much divided about whether this team can actually be successful this year because people think, well, they'll stay healthy. And people, you know, a lot of people are on the other side of it, and they say, absolutely not. You found this interesting tweet from Anthony DiComo, our really good friend. And, uh, you know, this basically kind of spells out everyone's biggest worry. Right. So yeah. It says, yeah, he's like, I'm not trying to be cynical. Uh, Zach Wheeler has not had a full healthy season since 2014. Matt Harvey has had exactly one since 2012. Matt has never had one. The Mets are um, staking their season on that changing while several dependable free agents starters still remain unsigned. That's all. That's pretty good, right? Well, yeah, and, and he's kind of just laying it out and yeah. being pretty honest and saying, you know, this could be a really mediocre season. Eye-opening, yeah. Right, like, this hey, could be a, a mediocre season for this team if they don't go get one of their those free agent starters. They've added other pieces, right? Yes. Uh, bringing in Jay Bruce, Anthony Swarzak, those were fantastic additions. But you got to add a piece to the starting rotation, and so uh, that's that's pretty interesting. So what we're doing here is we're calling fair or foul. Yes. Do you believe that the Mets will be contenders in 2018? I'm going to go foul. I do not think they're going to be contenders. I don't wow. think they're going to be even close. Now, listen, I agree that they added a couple pieces, but I looked at their win totals, and like you said, none of these guys were healthy. So Mr. Wheeler had three, Mr. Harvey five, Mr. Matz two, and Mr. Syndergaard one. And then Mr. DeGrom had 15. So that is, to me, kind of glaring, and that's something that you have to pay attention to. Now, look, if they're all healthy, maybe they can average out and get better, but that's where it starts. And for them to not add a guy who could have helped fortify the rotation, I feel like eh, that's, uh, that's bad on them. Yeah, I disagree. I think this team's going to absolutely pull it together. And maybe this is just my optimism and me wanting to see these guys succeed like sure. it did in 2016. But I do feel like a, a renewed training staff and a renewed sense of... That should help. These, well, that should help. <laughs> That's sure. Oh. But in yes. a re renewed sense of these guys, I mean, Seth Lugo and uh, Robert Gesellman both have more experience yes. and they can help, you know, bolster this starting rotation. Gesellman had eight wins last year. Right. So he had more combined than... 
the other guys. He, oh, he has some strong experience, and I do feel like, you know, they're going to have to rely really heavily on Jacob deGrom and Noah Syndergaard. These two are the workhorses of this rotation. They're they're ready to take on uh, that That's workload. That's going to you. You think that they're ready? I think deGrom is, I, I still feel like Syndergaard has something to prove this year. And I hope he has that chip on his shoulder. Well, and I think that's all part of it, right? I think last year, I mean, with the I don't want to go get an MRI and him, you know, kind of uh, butting heads with the training staff, yep. he has a renewed sense of, you know what, I'm going to do what's best for this team, not what's best for me. And th he realized that that's exactly what needs to happen in order for this team to be successful. So yes. uh, I do feel very strongly. I do also think the additions of the bats, you know, having Johannes Cespedes in there and having the addition of Jay Bruce, that all is going to help run support for these guys, take a little bit of pressure off them. So I believe not in Bruce. All on their shoulders. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, I do think this Mets team is going to turn it around this year. I do not believe that that one season run to the World Series was a fluke. But <laughs> Have we agreed on anything know. in the past like three weeks? No, that's why this works so well. <laughs> this is why the show, uh, it, it, uh, the juice, that's what makes it happen. All right, all right. We will be, I know you and I will be making a lot of trips to City Field this year. So yeah. Get oh, the popcorn wait. ready, folks. We're going to be just be bouncing back and forth between Yankee Stadium and City Field. We are. I'm psyched. Yes. All right, uh, we saw the Brewers have an awesome dance off on at Fan Fest, so the Giants decided to go ahead and one-up them. There wasn't a lot of music, but it didn't matter because Hunter Pence went ahead and danced anyway. Take a look. You got some music in here? Any music? Any music? I don't need any music. And then uh, we had more Man. important things to do. Hunter Pence, Sorry. that guy, is he afraid of anything? No. He no. has no, he just, go. he does it. He, I don't know anyone that doesn't dance without music. <laughs> you always need music to dance, right? I, know. I mean, well, I think there's just maybe a constant, constant album playing in his head. In his head. Yeah. Oh, there we oh, go. Come on. That's again. what we wanted. Okay. There we go. Look, it's, it's a slow build. It's a slow build. Oh, that was so good, though. He was he was getting faster. Do you this, think so. they feel pressure know. to, like, get up there and dance because Hunter Pence is there? Like, oh, man, like, I don't want to do this, but I probably should because I look sillier sitting down, not dancing. Yeah, and honestly, I think they practice their dance moves in the mirror. Like, when they're at home by themselves, they work on this. So when they that's get up what on you stage. Do? Is that what you do? So no? you just think that's what everyone else does? No. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. Good to know. <laughs> Our question of the day: uh, Name a more iconic duo. I'll yeah. wait. <laughs> okay. All right. I got. I got some great submissions for you. All right. I don't Our, know if I can top these two though. Our friends on Facebook. All right. First, we're actually going to show you uh, JJ Watt and Jose Altuve because Ooh. they are epically. That's a good rival. Iconic. Yes. The men in Houston, not only for their athleticism but their humanitarian. Anism as well. That is a tough word to say, uh, by the way. Yeah, that's a great duo. All right, our friends on Facebook. Let's go with Tim. I'm picking Chris Bryant and Jonathan Taves in Chicago. Mm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know about Taves so much. No like, Taves. Yes, I understand that he's great for that team, but uh, we're talking like iconic. Iconic. <laughs> How many cups does he have, Taves? Three? Two. Two. Two, Two or three? Yeah. All okay. right. You like this one, Marissa. Does Mike Trout and Carson Wentz count? Uh, no, they have to be from the same, oh, from the same tough, city. Tough, right? Mm. It's tough. Kind of. We're talking playing for the same city, but they're Playing from the same city. Although, Carson Wentz isn't from Philly. He's he not. He plays in Philly and Trout's from. Right. It's too complicated. They're not from the same I, place. I love the, I love Sorry, the, the effort. We but, love you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We have see rules here. here, Marissa, okay? Yeah. All right, Matt, you're, I love this one, Matt. This is great. Checking in from sunny Tampa, perhaps not the level of Stanton OBJ, uh -huh. but with no more Longo, I submit Steven Stamkos and Kevin Kiermeyer. The former nearly leads the league in points, and the latter leads Major League Baseball in good looks. <laughs> So says all my coworkers. Matt, I don't know where you work, but uh, <laughs> I, th I think that your point is very fair and valid. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. For that city, I would uh, I would agree. That's a good that's a good duo. And then Walter and Jamie kind of on the same page. They're like, hey, what, what about Judge? Walter said Judge and Porzingis, and Jamie said Judge and Lundquist. 
What do you think? Um, yeah, I don't know that I would say Porzingis, though. Because he got hurt. Yeah. Poor guy. He's out Yeah. Uh, for the season. We're talking about somebody who's currently making a big impact for their team and who has made a big impact. We're talking about guys with rings. Okay, right? I got one more for you. One okay. more. Matthew. <laughs> Steven Durant and Buster Bumgarner. What? Yeah. I didn't. Wait, wait. Say that again. <laughs> Steven. Oh, I <laughs> Dang it. I don't even I got all I mixed up, Matthew. It's are. Stephen. I said Stephen. It's Stephen. You got me all confused. So Steph now. Curry. Steph Curry. And who? Kevin Durant, Buster Posey, and Madison Bumgarner. Dang it. Okay, so breaking those off into two each, right? This you iconic duo them. versus this iconic duo. Because he duo. wanted to say four. Foursome. It's a foursome. Iconic foursome. Footer said a trio. How I said they... Stephen Durant. So <laughs> great Monday. Really, it was such a good show, too. It was such a good show. Uh, yeah, that's an that's a iconic Mount Rushmore, though, that's for sure. Yes, it we're is. We're going to play that it's game. Tough to, it's tough to beat that photo, but I think, I think if we look back, there would definitely be some. Someone mentioned uh, Michael Jordan as well and Ryan Sandberg uh, in Chicago. So That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking current players, though. I mean, I, I'm from D.C., so I would say Ovi and Bryce Harper. But, again, if I'm going to give, you know, Taze and Chris Bryant a hard time, yeah. I can't really say guys who haven't won rings for their city yet. That's right. So Not yet. Not yet. Almost. They're so close. Whew. So close, my friend. Um, yeah, so we'll see. All right, our final story here. Uh, back in 1994, we had a player who was tweeting out a photo when he was chilling in his Blue Jays gear. This is relief pitcher John Axford, the Axe Man, opening up Christmas presents and secretly asking Santa for just one Christmas wish. Well, guess what? That wish came true. <laughs> and it came true really, really recently because he was signed to be Blue, G Blue Jays on a minor league deal. And uh, the uh, Canada native is really, really excited about the fact that uh, this is happening. And he's basically like, this is my dream. This is every ball player's dream to play right. for their hometown. And uh, I'm more excited now than I was in that photo, even though I look super geeked out in that photo. So. I was excited because of his hairstyle <laughs> in that photo. Can we throw that up one more time and just check out? There's like well, a bang action happening. Yeah. So the bangs, the mullet. That is a mullet. Yes. It is a mullet. He's yes. rocking a mullet. So what I think is That's now. That's where the, the hair for his mustache came from. Yeah. I think that he should try to re-rock the mullet. And the mustache. Yes. He's got that iconic mustache, too. Bring it back. Bring okay. it back. That's all I'm asking. Listen, you got your wish now. I want my wish. Yeah. Bring back the mullet. I like it. All right. We're huge fans of mullets, so why <laughs> we not? Are. All kinds of crazy hair. Mullet Monday. All right. Mullet Monday. Yes. Yes, Danny. We're going to do can't... it again tomorrow, right? Yes. We'll do it again tomorrow. I can't wait. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Danny. See ya. And thank you for watching us here on this Monday edition of 1225 Live. Uh, appreciate Al Footer stopping by and joining us. And we will continue all of our spring training coverage all week long from Arizona and Florida. So don't miss out. We're going to do it tomorrow right here on MLB.com, same time, same place. So we will see you there uh, as well as Danny and I. So uh, take care and uh, tomorrow, be there. Bye.